consider for quite a while the effect of diffusion on mass transfer. Now, diffusion is basically a, um, a zero driving force effect. Really don't have to um, have a driving force for diffusion to occur. You can think of the diffusional effect as, as if you had a um, drunk coming out of a bar, some Mohs, and he's so drunk that he can only stagger one way or the next on the sidewalk. And uh, he can stagger one step and then he staggers back and staggers forth, staggers back. Now the position of that drunk after some period of time is going to be a statistical uh, occurrence. A drunk may be some distance down the street, he may be back at the bar entrance, or he may be some distance down the other way in the street. The basic description of that sort of thing is a, what they call a random walk. And you can have random walks in one, two, three, or as many dimensions as you care to have it. Uh, but what we can do is use binomial statistics to calculate um, where something is going to be after some amount of random walks. Well, we're not, we won't do the derivation, but the, the point is, is that if we have, if we think of this as time zero, one, two, three, four, and so on, and our drunk can only take steps of a certain length, we can lay out a little grid. And you see at time zero, our drunk is at the um, bar entrance, and he could have possibly walked one uh, step over, and this, this is again is time, so he could be over there, or he could have gone this way. At uh, time two, he could have gone to here, or here, or here. So you can see there's kind of a, a network being developed. Time three, he could be at uh, various points along this axis. And the point is, is that at some point, he's going to be somewhere and on around the mean, but he could be distributed anywhere along that, along that probability. And effectively, what you see if you do this process long enough, you just see a, a Gaussian distribution of states. And this is what happens, for example, if we take a, a some concentration of some solution and we drop it into a, a bucket of water, and if we just allow diffusion to occur, that spread will be a, a Gaussian type distribution. In that case, it would be a three-dimensional Gaussian uh, distribution. Well, we can draw that mathematically. We can say the average displacement, this mean square deviation from zero, is related to the length of the step, the time between steps, and the total time of the system. So this is the mean square displacement. And so our drunk may take a, a step that's one yard or so. He may take a step every second. A molecule in solution may move on the order of a microsecond or nanosecond and move only a few uh, angstroms or a few nanometers. And so the tau length of step or the time per step. So that would be a, a experiment that's kind of discrete. Uh, we can actually rewrite the equation in terms of the diffusion coefficient, where the diffusion coefficient incorporates the length and the time per step. and um, that's a, a constant for a particular species. And it usually has units of centimeters squared per second. For a molecule in aqueous solution, we typically see diffusion coefficients from 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6 for small molecules. If you get the molecules that are bigger, 
500 and so molecular weight, we might get to 10 to the minus 7. And of course, the concentration, as the viscosity of the solution changes, the diffusion coefficient changes as well. All right. And D is related to um, sort of the mean free path. And uh, as I said, these are the, the relationships to it. I just want to show you on the um, computer how easy it is to, to calculate something like this. You can see here the um, a random walk simulation where I show the displacement uh, versus time. I got a lot of points, so this computer is a little slow. But you can see there's two lines which should be the average displacement either in a positive or negative direction. And each of those set of points is a, a different set. And if we can, we can recalculate it, I think. There we go. And uh, you can see now that the, the distribution of points has changed. But each, each one would be some time. And you can see some points are far out of the, on the uh, graph, and some points are closer to the graph and um, to the middle, and some are close to zero displacement, as you'd expect. So there's like 50 different traces on it. And I put that on the web page if you want to play with that a little bit. You can see what happens. There's no, there's no telling where that particle is going to be. It can be a maximum distance away, depending on the number of steps you take but it could be anywhere within that envelope. But it will most likely be on average on this, around this line. Okay. So for our electrochemical experiment, we can think about our average displacement as being equal to the square root of 2 dt, uh, which means that we can think about times and diffusion events. So if we give our molecule one second uh, to diffuse, we can calculate our average displacement as about um, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 3, assuming D is equal to 10 to the minus 6 centimeters squared per second. And that's about uh, 14 micrometers. If our time is 100 uh, seconds, or 1.4 times 10 to the minus 2, or 140 micrometers away. So because of the square root dependence, it takes quite a long time actually to see a significant uh, movement. Uh, if we go to a 1 millisecond time scale, now we're down to 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters or approximately 1.4 microns. So that's one I kind of like to remember is uh, a millisecond is about a micron. It taken, giving yourself a millisecond in an experiment is about a micron's worth of, of diffusion. So if you don't want to, your molecule to diffuse very far, you have to do your experiment in a very short period of time. Okay. <clears throat> Well, this diffusional process can be modeled by two important equations. And these are the two equations that we're going to be interested in. The first one is called Fick's first law of diffusion. And it says that the current Dependent, divided by the charge and the, and the area is equal to the flux of species J along some, time, uh, some axis X at some time T is equal to minus D and the gradient of the concentration of species J, A, J 
oops, dx, not dt, sorry, dx. So the flux of species J is, that's given by, for diffusion is going to be related to the concentration gradient of species J. The sharper that concentration gradient is, the higher the flux rate will be, and it will be also dependent on the value of the diffusion coefficient. And we can think about why diffusion really doesn't require any activation. It doesn't require any energy. It's just a simple statistical distribution. Um, suppose we have a set of boxes that contain solution that have imaginary boundaries. Well, if we put in species J in uh, that box at the start, because of the random motion of the molecules, some of those molecules will find themselves after some period of time in species um, in the next box over. So there will be some flux of species J in the next box. Let's see if we can draw this a little bit so I can write it. Draw these boxes bigger. So J, the species J, the flux of J going into the next box and then the flux of species J that's modified somewhat is going to be X plus delta X T and, and so on. And so we're going to move in each of those boxes. Now there's always some fraction will be find itself in an empty box and some of course will diffuse back into the original boxes but there's always going to be some movement along that axis to fill up the, all those boxes. So eventually that concentration gradient will force all the boxes to have an equal amount of J in it if we allow diffusion to occur on the, on the um, a long time scale. So that's the first law of diffusion that will help us to solve these things. What about the second law? And this second law gives us the change in concentration with time. So the change in concentration with time is equal to the diffusion coefficient of species J times the second derivative of the concentration of J with respect to the to X. All right, so both of these that I've written are for fixed first law and second law are for one dimensional diffusion on in a down a one dimension gradient. Obviously in most situations we're going to have more than one dimension of diffusional process. We can have many dimensions, like three dimensions is possible. So generally we can write, say for um, fixed second law, we can write Uh, engine, your engineering students will probably be more familiar with this. The a grad function, which is just a, a, a generalized uh, function that we can substitute any sort of transformation that we like. Um, so the grad function for a um, spherical diffusion rather than one dimensional diffusion would be equal to um, the derivative, the second derivative with respect to um, R or rewriting our um, fixed second law for spherical coordinates rather than one dimensional coordinates, one dimensional linear coordinates would be just like so. That's a little bit more complicated than the equation for in one di in one dimension. 
You've got a similar term here and here for the two, but you see that this part of the expression for spherical coordinates, I should write that there, spherical coordinate, is different. What's the difference? Well, in a one-dimensional problem, we can consider that the area of our electrode never changes. The amount of solution available to, to feed a one-dimensional electrode is always the same. Whereas for a sphere, what happens is that um, because diffusion is allowed to occur in three dimensions in the sphere, the volume of solution that diffusion is occurring in is constantly growing. So at short times, the volume of solution affected by diffusion is quite small, but at long times, that amount grows and grows, and so that term here is this uh, second part of the term here that is uh, relating that expression, the area change. All right. 